Hi, I'm Roger Michaud. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Sun National Bank, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Roche, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work. And by Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is a series called The Edge of Knowledge. It is my pleasure to introduce our colleague and friend, Dr. Joel Bloom, who is the president of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. The Edge of Knowledge is an ongoing series that we are doing in cooperation with NJIT. This particular initiative in the Edge of Knowledge look at, looks at the latest advances in biomedical research. Joel, let me ask you, we were just saying before we got on the air that these latest advances can only advance if you hire certain kinds of faculty in a, let's say, non-traditional fashion, right. which means? Well, it means you need, they need to be more interdisciplinary. Uh, when you look at biomedical research today, uh, you're looking at computing, big data. You're looking at information technology, the transmission of data, the, the, the whole issue of networking. Obviously, we've got people with backgrounds in biology, in the medical sciences. You bring them together as a team. As we've seen, the best outcomes of research is when you're teaming people with different disciplines and their background. They stimulate, they encourage, and they have another, another way of looking at the solution to the problem. So we have been hiring faculty, not so much to put them into academic departments, mm. that they pick afterward. First, we have said we're interested in focusing on three interdisciplinary areas of research. The whole issue of the convergence of the life sciences engineering and technology. Excuse me, life sciences, engineering, and, and technology. technology. Go ahead. For, you know, if, you, if today you're having something to do with the medical sciences, we all realize the instrumentation um, that is being used is engineered. The facility you may be in, clean room technology, engineered. An implant you may be receiving, it's been engineered. So it's a partnership between medicine, the life sciences, the engineering, and the technology. So that's a major focus for us. So we want to hire people who can work across those disciplines. Second focus is sustainability. Everything that in part is green. Uh, we just experienced Katrina. It's time to look at how we built Sandy. You know, Sandy, sorry. You know, Sandy. You're saying that because you're also sure. involved in doing research with connecting Tulane. the experience of Katrina with Tulane real quick yes. and learning from that to help in connection with Sandy. That's why you're thinking about That's, it. Uh, yes, so today we've been talking with our faculty colleagues at Tulane about the work we did down there, and now they're coming up and helping us with the research they've been doing in an ongoing way to rebuild shorelines, coastlines, right. infrastructure, housing, public facilities. Talk about so, interdisciplinary. <laughs> absolutely. So you've got architects, you've got civils, right. you've got material scientists, you've got a lot of folks. And our third area is, is more or less the information society. Um, and it ties back to the first as we think about it. Go ahead. Uh, NGIT is leading the state with a $23 million grant from the federal government to help more physicians work with electronic medical records, to integrate that with hospitals, with insurance companies. You or I visit physician A one day, physician B, a hospital B the next day. Those records should be able to move seamlessly so that they can quickly do diagnosis and treatment. Right now, that doesn't happen if everything's written in a folder, kept in a file cabinet, and you may move around or have other reasons to be in different kind of medical facilities. And much of that has to do with the implementation of the January 2014 new federal law that uh, Congress and the President uh, 
may not have agreed to, but it is the law. It's the law. It's it the is. electronic medical record. The series is called The Edge of Knowledge. This is a panel discussion coming back right after this. The latest advances in biomedical research. I want to thank Dr. Joel Bloom, the president of NJIT, for setting the context and the stage for this. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Check it out right after this. A great panel discussion. Here we go with that panel discussion. I'm Steve Adubato. Let me introduce the folks we have in the studio. Stephen Medora is director of biobanking at the Coriel Institute of, excuse me, for medical research. We also have Trina Livingston Arinze, professor of biomedical engineering at NJIT. Karen Froberg Faco is serves on the board of the New Jersey Association of Biomedical Research. And finally, Debbie Hart, president and CEO, BioNJ. I want to thank all of you for joining us. By the way, log on to the website you're going to see, particularly the one at NJIT. They are our educational partner. They are the ones doing a lot of this uh, scientific and educational research. They are the ones with a lot of the information. All right, here we go. We're listening to Dr. Bloom here, and I'm trying to take it to the next level. Help us understand this. Um, Trina, if we are now talking about one of the areas that we did not get into here that I want to make clear, tissue engineering. What is it, and why is it so important as a part of biomedical research, and ultimately, three-part question, what does it mean to the average person watching right now? Okay, so tissue engineering, ear engineering, or otherwise known as regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine, medicine go ahead. Is, is just that, trying to regenerate damaged tissues or diseased tissues with, with a novel way of, of treating us, which is use of cells, and these could be a patient's own cells or donor cells. Um, and there could be these inductive factors, cues is what we call them. And you also combine that with some engineering tools in order to do that. What kind of progress have we made? We've made substantial progress. A lot of it is basic research, but also a lot of it is in development. And there are also companies now have uh, actual therapies on the market. There are a few products on the market available that use cell-based approaches to repair, repair tissues. Let's break this down. Let's get a little more specific, okay? Personalized medicine. All right, Stephen, we've talked about, I've heard this talked about a lot. The Coriel Institute, by the way, what is it? It's a biobank. It's in, it's in Camden. We're celebrating actually our 60th year this year. Right. And it was established back in 1953 by Louis Coriel. And a biobank is basically We're a nonprofit a, research. We're a nonprofit research institute. And basically, a biobank is a large collection of biospecimens. And we have probably one of the largest and most diverse collections of biospecimens in the world. Personalized medicine, why? Why is it that you told our producers this was important to talk about? Right. So in addition to biobanking, one of the, um, an active area of research at the Coriel Institute is, is personalized medicine. So personalized medicine is probably easier to understand if you take it and compare it to what the way traditional medicine is practiced today, where it's sort of a uh, one-size-fits-all, throw-the-net-over, trial-and-error type approach. Personalized medicine is really using uh, information like medical history, family background, lifestyle, environment, as well as the genetic, in, the genetic makeup of people to try to design more of a patient-centric approach mm. to medicine. What does that do for us? What does it do for um, patients? What does it do for over, the overall quality of healthcare and medicine? It does two things. First of all, um, one of the things that we look at in the Personalized Medicine Collaborative at, at Coriel is a person's response to drugs based on their genetic makeup. Right. Now, of the five of us here in this room, if we looked at our DNA sequence, we're about 99% similar. But 1%, the differences in our DNA sequence it accounts for the variation, makes us all different. And one of the things that happens is that variation also dictates how we respond to drugs. And so if you could predict or if, it, if a, a medical doctor could say, you know, you, you have this particular genetic makeup, so therefore... Um, you're going to have this response to this drug, or we're going to use this drug instead of this drug because it's safer based on your genetic makeup. It's important. By the way, I want to make sure everyone knows that every non not for profit website, educational website connected, to, and which is all of you, will be connected to this show. So that's why you see so many. Debbie, uh, describe your organization because you've been out there a long time doing this. We've been doing it for 20 years. So we are the biotechnology industry organization in New Jersey. And we, our companies are biotech companies as well as pharma companies and those, the cluster around it, the, uh, the service providers who are, who are helping the companies make those medical advances that we're hearing about. Make it clear mm -hmm. what the connection is. Because you've, you've said in preparation for the show, and I've heard you say this before, that state government has a huge role 
and facilitating this biomedical research initiative, I'm thinking, okay, why does government have that role? Go ahead. Absolutely, because first of all, it's so competitive on where companies go. So state government you know, saying we are interested in this community, we want to help it grow, is clearly an attractive tool How do to they do get it? companies to go. Be specific. Well, so, so New Jersey actually has been tremendous. Uh, way back since Governor Kane, who set up the Commission on Science and Technology, and each and every governor since Governor then, Tom Kane did uh, that? He set did. up a commission <clears throat> on science and technology because New Jersey was so far behind. Well, it was in the early days of biotech, so right. we weren't we weren't that far behind. Well, we got fact. behind, and, but go ahead. And, well, and the fact that you know we have big pharma here, have had big pharma right. here forever, is really important to what we have in New Jersey. Um, but yes, each and every governor, Governor Christie, has just been amazing. In fact, just last week he signed the Angel Investor Tax Credit Act, uh, which will incent hopefully investors to invest in biotechnology companies and technology companies. Um, just yesterday, the EDA issued an RFP. The Economic Development Authority. The I'm sorry, yes, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority issued an RFP for a life sciences accelerator, which will get to the really early stages, which is one of the places that New Jersey, we have some really strong programs, early stages, one of the ones that could use some bolstering. This will, in fact, do that. So they get an educational piece, academic institutions like yours. You've got associations, trade associations. You've got not-for-profit research organizations like yours and yours. Explain it. Well, we have, we're the New Jersey Association of Biomedical Research, and we're an advocacy uh, organization that uh, is a group of researchers, caregivers to the research animals, and we, you know, we promote and we educate not only researchers in our community, but also the general public and uh, our youth about what it is that we do. You know, these wonderful advances in research come about because not only do we have to use animals in research, which is a, a non it's not a palatable topic, but it's a reality. But also we like to describe what it is that we do for these animals. There's caregivers like myself and others, so many others that commit their life to their care. And also that we want to make sure that we just spread the word that these wonderful things that we discover not only benefit the human kind, but animal kind, pets as well. And that's a very important thing that we like to make sure we advocate and speak about. And also we commit our our war, our whole careers into refinements, the three R's. Yeah, three R's. The three, you said three R's, R's are initiative. reducing, refining, refining and, replacing. and replacing. What does that mean? And re so refining, refining some of the protocols to which we don't have do-overs where we might be able to use less animal species or lower species, perhaps do it in um, cells, much like you do, replacement, looking at technology to which we don't use animals in those protocols, and of course, um, reduction, reduction in the use of our uh, in, vo in vivo species, animal species. Okay. Um, there's another area. And human species, because humans are a big part of research as well. And by the way, uh, I'm curious, have you gotten less <clears throat> pressure from animal rights groups on some of these issues? The oh, I would say no. There's no less pressure. I think because there's still a lot of, um, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but there's a lot of ignorance about what it is that it, what research does and how animals are used in research. And rather, if people wanted to find out more, at least what your organization yes. says, can they log onto your website Absolutely. and find out? Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to come back to you on this. Um, Trina, help us. Um, some of the other most important cutting edge areas that you feel the average person watching, not the person who's on the inside, not the person who's totally engaged in biomedical research, but the average person watching asking the question, why should I watch this public television programming about biomedical research? Why should I care? The answer is? Because we are developing cutting edge uh, therapies to treat various types of diseases and conditions. So. And I'm in, I'm, so I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, highly interdisciplinary, where we're using engineering, engineering tools, engineering methods, and we're also combining that with cells. Some of the research that we're doing and some of the development work that we're doing is in the area of spinal cord repair. Hold on, you're on the um, engineering side. I'm on the engineering. So people say, oh, so you're involved with people who build bridges. Yeah, but so we're doing that except in the body. So right. spinal cord, for example, you have a spinal cord injury, we have to bridge that gap. When someone gets injured there, how do you actually get those nerve, these axons, those processes to actually extend back, kind of grow back along that cord? So that's engineering? That's engineering because we're designing materials and we're using cells in combination to actually get those axons or nerves to grow, grow back. And the, 
average person should care because come on keep it going because this so is we very, can get this the pipeline is, going because people yeah. still don't get quote what it means to them so there there are over a million people suffering from spinal cord injuries okay and and that continues to increase year to year due to traumatic injuries and other conditions i'm also involved in orthopedic uh, research both bone and cartilage repair uh, types of therapies uh, knee injuries are are happening all the time because of again as we age, our cartilage continues to degenerate. And also there's a growing um, obesity epidemic, epidemic. So our knees are continuing to deteriorate as we increase in weight. And so um, with that growing population, we need alternative therapies. Uh, we can't use total knee replacements on younger patients if they're getting these injuries early. So this is a critical, critical therapy. Um, there's a whole host of conditions. Um, if you have brain injury or if you have other type of degenerative type of diseases that affect the brain, then what kinds of therapies can you use for that? And again, we're using innovative cell therapy approaches to, to And that's to biomedical research. That's all biomedical research. Stephen, you've, you've said that some of this often sounds like science fiction, is it? Uh, I don't think it's science fiction. I think, I think the tissue engineering thing is an especially um, promising area. And, and, and one of the things that I think people have to realize about biomedical research is that all starts with basic laboratory research that people have been doing for years and years and years and really allowing people to build upon their discoveries. And we talk about translational research where the discoveries that are made, the basic discoveries that are made in the laboratory can be translated into actually treating patients, much like um, what, what we're talking about in terms of regenerative medicine. It, that, that really originates from basic laboratory research that's done at the bench. Mm. What is digital development? Digital development. I hear, you hear that term get thrown out a lot. What does it mean? Any sense of that? I mean, it may be it may be related also to some of this human genome sequencing and some of the oh data. Oh my God, the all jargon the, is driving me crazy. The data. You say that again. Human gen genome sequencing and data mining and collecting that has to happen. It's huge amounts of data that needs to be stored right. and do, mined. Do um, you folks? Let me ask you this. And, and I, because I'm a person, my science, if you will, which isn't a science at all, it's a craft, um, is communication. I'm, I often struggle with the question of language and how one of the reasons message sent doesn't equal message received is that we use different languages yeah. and that the jargon, whether it's tied to acronyms or just language that, whether it's legalese or medical language or clinical scientific language, research-driven language, whatever, um, often creates barriers. And I don't want to open up a Pandora's box here, but you do have your own language in biomedical research that is not for the rest of us. Isn't it, do you, you ever realize, you, if, say you're at a cocktail party, and you get into a conversation with you know, normal people. I'm joking, but you, you get my point. <laughs> you ever realize that most folks don't get what you're saying? Yes. Am when I you say, this well, up? even the term biomedical research is foreign to a lot of people, but if you start to assimilate it to some, some disease syndrome that they have, they're diabetic, right. and they take insulin, and it cures or ma manages their That's diabetes. That's biomedical research. Let's they break that. What is bi biomedical research that. is that? What's that? That's just uh, that's a, a way that they can understand the message of the importance of making sure we're kind of always pushing that ball forward to find cures for those diseases that afflict humankind and animal kind. That's a great way to look at it. Debbie, biomedical, you have to do this all the time because you interact with legislators, people in the corporate world. You're, you're constantly out there. Biomedical research is... Well, and, and I'm not a scientist and I don't play one on TV, but, <laughs> but it is basically it's taking, uh, you know, organisms that, uh, that are in the body using biocellular processes to develop therapies and cures. You just wanted to say um, biocellular, biocellular processes? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> and find, but the key word is cures. Right. Is yeah, that it? And cures. Absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, Steve, we're all doing this, you know, it's about the patient. And that's why we're all here, and that's why it's so critically important. And you know, you talked about science fiction. This industry, why it's so important, why it's so important, what it's doing here in New Jersey, and needs to continue doing what it's doing in New Jersey, is so that we can make it less science fiction. Take the fiction out of it, make it more science. It's just it's where, so By the way, where does patients. New Jersey, I'm just curious about this, Debbie. You, you as an advocate, and you're very well respected down the halls of the legislature, but you've also seen, you, you see the way things work, politics, public policy. Where does New Jersey rank among the other states in terms of where we are with respect to this field of biomedical research 
Where are we? So it depends on the category that you're talking about, okay, of course. So you might expect that I would say that. Where I come from, the, the number of biotechnology companies is the key measure. And in that regard, we were 80 biotechnology companies in New Jersey in 1998. We are more than 350 today, and that growth continues. It does not include big pharma, does not include medical device. And of course, you know, Boston, Massachusetts is the, is the big hub. Um, I, think, I think even more so, depending on whose list you look at, you know, even more so than Southern California. California clearly is, a, you know, is right there along with them. And New Jersey is Massachusetts been, is way up there, right? <laughs> Massachusetts is way up there. Now, I mean, yeah. what has it done for that state? Oh, from an economic been point of view, immeasurable, immeasurable. I mean, the economics, uh, the economic impact is just dramatic, really dramatic. And so, a huge collaboration between institutions of higher learning in, in Massachusetts and the private sector, right? That's really been the key. That's been how their growth has happened. And is that happening more and more in New Jersey? Institutions of higher learning, because I know that the NGIT has the incubator. We, we did a special on the whole incubator thing going on. I mean. Yeah. Isn't that required collaboration and partnerships between institutions of higher learning and private sector organizations? It is. And it's, you know, we're seeing more and more of it, more and more effort, more and more plans. So NJIT is a great example. And NJIT, their people are at our meetings all the time, time talking to industry. Now, with the merger of UMDNJ, Rutgers, I think you know the, the sky's the limit for what New Jersey can do in terms of facilitating that kind of interaction between uh, industry and academia. We need that collaboration, right? I believe so. And if you know, getting back to Boston, if, if you go through Boston and Cambridge, you see the presence of a lot of the big drug companies now have yeah. moved to right. Cambridge, and it's because of the proximity to both biotech and the prestigious That's universities interesting. A lot of the like decisions Harvard that were made by pharmaceutical companies to go to Boston in that area is in some ways based on the investment of higher ed oh, yeah. in those fields That's right. in that area. Right? That's MIT, let's exactly go through it. Right. MIT is up there. Harvard is up there, right? Yeah. Just That's not a bad start, right? Mass General. What else? Mass, Mass General is up there. Yeah. Hospital. Mass Harvard Medical Huge School. Huge Harvard, Harvard Medical, Medical School, right? Partners. BU. Great BU research Medical. institutions. Mm -hmm. So that synergy is huge. Mm -hmm. That's economic. Yeah. That's jobs. That's going back to cures for patients, right? Is that is that what part of what we're trying to do, or is that too oh. big? Oh no, I, I yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is actually get that technology out there in the market. Some of the things that we're creating in the academic setting, what I'm creating in my laboratory, I need to get that out into into patients quickly. So it's 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 developing and getting these potential spin-off companies uh, from some of the laboratory work that we're doing underway. 2013, so. where could you see us being? 2013, right? Or 2023, 10 years from now. Where could you see us? So I'll go back to my original uh, description of personalized medicine. I think that's 10 years in the future. Um, we talked a little bit about whole genome sequencing in the in the variation in of English come on in English so basically what's going to happen is very very soon it took it took about uh, I think it's 13 years to to generate a whole genome sequence from a human being right. it took and a lot of money but the technology has advanced to such a state now that we'll be able to sequence your genome overnight for under a thousand dollars so less than an MRI the economics will change the economics will change and what will happen is um, as we as we get more and more uh, human uh, genome sequences compiled, we'll be able to assess what what significance are these variants we talked about. And again, people, uh, physicians will be able to sort of peek into our whole genome and look at these changes and again, be able to really... Big picture, 10 years, go. Patient I see with the collaboration, again, you're going to have a win-win because you have a, a consolidation of your spend so, and a sharing of information. So there's less uh, having to do it over here or over here, you're doing it here and you're spreading that information collaboratively. So again, you're going back to the three R's, if you will. So you're refining and reducing and, and, and you're moving the ball forward to, uh, to share in all of these wonderful discoveries that are found in the lab and then they're taken to the next step, to the, to the to the, the companies that can get that information, that technology out to the end user, the people that need it. Well, you've all done a tremendous public service. This is a complex subject. Biomedical research. 
broken down, hopefully, in a way that you can understand, appreciate, because it affects you every day. Thank you all very much. Thank Great you. job. Thank Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. Visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Sun National Bank. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. Roche. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Making health care work. And by Cone Resnick providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, The Star Ledger, and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Education reform is too important to get wrong. That's why NJEA's plan establishes a strong evaluation process that identifies excellent teachers, removes ineffective ones, and ensures hiring and firing is based on performance, not politics or standardized tests that are unfair to students and teachers. We all want the best teachers in every classroom, because when it comes to education reform, NJEA believes students come first. NJEA, great public schools for every child.